<laughs> I think I would give it that. In the context of the tragedy we have in this nation, most churches and uh, most festivities have been seized, actually. They have turned into mourning period, and uh, I think rightly so. In the same line today, we are celebrating the antidote to these kind of mournings and sadness and sorrow that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the same line, I put my title here, A Great Reversal that took place 2,000 years ago. That humanity has been longing to have this reversal ever since sin entered human race and death began to rule there has been this longing for human beings to overcome death that longing we saw how some primitive tribes would not touch the dead body from the place where they die and they will keep those bodies as they are hoping that someday life will return to them. And then we come to a civilized uh, culture like Egypt, uh, where we see the mummification of body, hoping that someday life will come back into this body. And this goes on for history, tells how humanity longs for the reversal of death. Death has become <coughs> such a terrifying enemy of final blow that you and I cannot tolerate. Imagine family members now sitting at the shore of Zindo Island waiting. Some are shouting on the microphone calling their children's name. Some are beating their chest. Some even want to jump into the water and try to go and find their own loved ones. Because death is such a terrifying thing to imagine. And imagine, suppose you go and lay down your loved one in the grave and you come back home with this desire that somehow something miraculous would happen and that the loved one would come and show up at the table. Or something would happen that you would not remember that you have buried your loved one and you come and you have still a chance to meet. That's the longing. That's the, that the surreal feeling that something terrible has happened and yet we wish it to be reversed. But yet, it is sad, a cruel reality of life that it never happens. Not only in the ancient time, people try to mummify their body, hoping that life will come back. Even today, we call it, what do you call, uh, or or freezing the human body. There is a, sci a science developing in which they can freeze our bodies in the same condition that we die, so that hoping that tomorrow some technology develops where our life can be resuscitated into that corpse. They are freezing. And in fact, Russians only freeze the brain. They throw away the body. It's too difficult to freeze the whole thing. So they just want to freeze the brain, brain hoping that someday there would be a technology that will bring life back so that they can revive the brain again. Then. We have some scientists trying to develop what we call the mind upload. They want to download our mind as we are. Our every thought, our feeling, our action, our words, they want to download into a, some kind of a file and then create a robot on which they can upload our mind so that the robot can function just like we. That's another attempt people are trying to do. Then there is another nanotechnology trying to create nanobots, which is nanorobots. They would try to inject these nanobots into the systems of human body so that eventually the nanobot would replace our natural parts and you will never die. But they haven't succeeded yet. It's a human desire to live forever. A human desire to reverse the process of death and decay. And even 
great atheists like Hitchinson's, when they came face to face with death, they began to wonder. A great hedonist like Oscar Wilde, when he came face to face with death, he did not want to die in uncertainty. And he calls a priest and he confesses his sin and then he dies. A great dictator like Hugo Chavez, when he faced death, it is widely published that his last words were to his general by the bedside, please don't let me die, I don't want to die human desire to live on, human desire to reverse the death and the decay is there all the time. Yet, they are unable. But praise God, 2,000 years ago, this reversal has taken place. 2,000 years ago, unimaginable happened, and unthinkable happened, and Jesus Christ the Son of the living God who walked on the face of the earth just like you and me, lived in the human flesh goes to the cross, is willing to be buried, and comes out of the grave, declares that I leave, therefore you also live. I leave, therefore you also live. In that same line, therefore, I want to focus our attention that in Christ Jesus, there is this great reversal taking place. Jesus has turned the tide of death and decay on the other side. And now we, even though our physical body is yet to see that reversal, our spirit has already sinned and our body is waiting for the final day to come and to experience the final reversal. Let me read Luke chapter 24 verse 1 to 8 in the same line of this great reversal and our responsibility, our, our, our heart's desire to see it happen in our own life. Luke chapter 24, verse 1 to 8. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. <coughs> they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Then they remembered his words. The disciples also did not have faith in this great reversal. They had no faith that Jesus would come back to life. In fact, Abraham had greater faith than these disciples. Because Abraham, when he took his son Isaac to the Mount Moriah to sacrifice, his son asked, Father, where is the lamb? And Abraham said, the Lord will provide my son. And so far as he goes and willing to sacrifice his only son, knowing that the God who gave Isaac to him can raise him from the dead. But here are the disciples. They have been faithful to Jesus during the ministry time period. And now they are even faithful to him even though he's dead and gone, they want to serve his body. They want to remain faithful because on the day Jesus died, it was the preparation day. And immediately the Sabbath followed. And on the Sabbath day, they could not help. They could not minister to his body. And therefore, they waited the Sabbath to pass. And early in the morning on Sunday, these disciples, we only think that the women go, it is possible that the whole bunch of disciples decided for the women to go so that the guard and the, the persecution would be less. They would not be attacked or harassed. So women go to the tomb with the spices to minister to the dead body of Jesus Christ because they did not have enough faith to believe that he would come back to life. And because they did not have the faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they did not have the faith in the, the words of Jesus Christ, they had to worry. 
Mark says they worried who will roll away the stone for us? Who will do this? Who will do that? What will happen? They have been plagued with fear and worry. And their lack of faith in what Jesus has said not only made them to worry and fear, but when they came to the tomb, they were utterly disappointed that they did not find the body of Jesus. They were confused, and instead of believing that Jesus rose from the dead, they were bewildered. What happened? Where is the body? In other gospels say, where have you taken our Lord's body? Lack of faith in the words of Jesus Christ makes these disciples to be utterly disappointed. They came to look for the dead body of Jesus, and that also they could not find. And in their confusion, in their frustration, when they were still turning around, they come the angels. And when they saw the angels, they were terrified and began to worship the angels. Now think about a Jewish people worshiping something other than God is unimaginable. But they were so terrified, so fearful, they bowed down to them with their faces on the ground. That is only uh, used when you, when you worship God. Whenever it says they bow down to their face on the ground, that means they worship the Lord God Almighty. And here, when the angels come, these women fall on their faces before them. Disciples did not have faith in this great reversal. The reason they did not believe in His Word. When they did not believe in His Word, they had to go through the agonizing night of worry and fear and frustration. And when they came to the tomb, they were utterly disappointed. When they were utterly dis disappointed, and the, in the very <clears throat> spark of light when it came in the tomb, they were either terrified whether the guards came or the soldiers came, and they began to worship them. It is interesting, it has said, if you stop <coughs> believing in God, then you will start believing in anything. If you stop believing in the words of Jesus Christ, then you will start believing in anything. You will start worshipping anything. If you have no faith in the words of Jesus Christ, you will be filled with worry, fear, and confusion, and anxiety. And when you keep on living in that, you will come to a place where you will be totally disappointed, and to come out of your disappointment, you will start worshipping anything that comes your way. That's what the disciples we see represented by the women. They had no faith in great reversal because they did not believe what Jesus said. You and I, as Christian, we may come to church, we may sing songs and we may lift our hands and our, raise our voices and worship and speak in tongue, give our offerings, <clears throat> do certain mission work and help here and there. But if you do not believe in the words of Jesus Christ, you will never be able to overcome your fear and your anxiety, your worry and your disappointment. And eventually you will start either worshipping the church or the leadership of the church or money or anything else. Because that's what we see. If you do not believe in the words of Jesus Christ, your Christianity is going to be a very weak Christianity. Here are the disciples who have been with Jesus, but yet unable to believe in the words of Jesus Christ. And therefore unable to believe in the very central message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, he will rise from the dead. But praise God, that is not the end of the story. In the, even though we lack faith, even though we are unfaithful, even though we cannot believe, then comes the hand of God's grace. 
the grace of God rescues these disciples. The grace of God rescues these women out of their lack of faith by sending these angels, by sending the angels to tell them that Jesus is no longer there. They had to be reminded of the very words Jesus spoke to them through the ministry of the angel. That's because God is a merciful God. He is a gracious, gracious God. He will not let us perish in our lack of faith or unfaithfulness. Somehow, He will send His angels to rescue us. Sometimes angels may come in the human form. Sometimes angels may come in even animal forms. Sometimes angels may come in tragedy or pain and sorrow or sickness. Angels may come in any form so that they drive us back to what Jesus had said. In the grace of God, He rescues us from our faithlessness by pointing us to what Jesus said. Just like in the birth of Jesus Christ, there were angels in heaven and coming unto the shepherds said, that, Go in the town of Bethlehem. A Savior is born for you today. Angels tell them the gospel of the birth of Jesus Christ, message of the birth of Jesus Christ. Now here again, when the disciples come to the end of their life, God in His mercy sends angels to tell them the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the grace of God. Even in our personal life, we think that, oh, it's useless to believe in Jesus Christ. Have you come to that stage? Oh, way to pray. How much I have to pray. It's no point of going to church, no point of reading the Bible. Uh, there are many, many times in our life we come to that stage. But God in His divine mercy, in a miraculous way, reaches down underneath our sinking ship and lifts us up and our faith is once again revived. Maybe you have not come to that stage, but I have come quite many times. I remember as a young believer, I was expelled from home, uh, rejected from home, uh, disowned by family. I was working in a school. I was, uh, I was caught preaching the gospel to the students and therefore I was expelled from the school. And then something happened in a miraculous way. I began to speak in tongue and I didn't know that was sin in that church. And the church kicked me out of their fellowship because I spoke in unknown tongue in a miraculous way which I never knew I was speaking. And I was utterly disappointed. A 19 years old young boy, so to say, in today's language, those days man. Very discouraged. And I remember one afternoon thinking, have I made a mistake of changing my religion? Is this Christianity really serious? Is this God truly, truly real? Is there really a God after all? And that afternoon, I decided to abandon my faith in Christ. Maybe I told you a few times before. And the, the way to abandon my faith was to commit a sin. And in those days, if you watch a movie, that was considered to be a sinful act. Now, all, all are sinners here. So I remember leaving the place where I was by about 2.30 because 3 o'clock movie started. So I said, I'm going to abandon this God anymore because I see no reason. I, have, I prayed and I fasted. I read the Bible. I believed my friends who don't believe in God doing well. And why am I miserable? I have no place to go, nowhere to live, no job, no money, nothing. The more I believe in Him, the more miserable I become. So I said, God, I'm going to abandon you. Even if you're there, I don't care. So I was going towards the movie hall. And halfway to the movie hall, a long lost friend from New Delhi comes to that border town in Nepal. And he, to make the long story short, he turns me around and takes me to a new church pastor and introduces me to a new ministry. And here I am today. And I've always told him that you are the mysterious angel God sent. Rescue me from the sinking ship. My brothers and sisters, 
the gospel of Jesus Christ is so glorious that even when you lack faith, when you make mistakes, when you do stupid things, this grace of God is so amazing that he will send the messengers and they will rescue you and they will give you faith. They'll create faith within your heart. They'll tell you to remember what Jesus said. The moment you start remembering what Jesus said, your ship begins to sail again. If you only believe in the angels, if you only believe in the circumstances, you may not succeed very much. But the point of God sending those angels and messengers is that you begin to listen to the words of Jesus Christ once again. You begin to believe in what Jesus said. Look at these women and the disciples. Jesus had time and again told them, I am going to rise up. In three days, I will destroy this temple and rebuild again. And he was telling about himself. He said, I will rise up again. I will be delivered. I'll be crucified and killed. But I will rise up again. Many, many times he had said it. But they refused to believe in those words. And now, when the angels come, and then it says, they remembered his word. They remembered his word. In Acts 2, 22 to 24, this is how they remembered. Peter is now, after the day of Pentecost, preaching, and definitely he is preaching out of the rem remembrance of the words of Jesus Christ. What did he remember about the death of Jesus Christ? Listen to Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 24. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourself know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Here is a disciple now, declaring after 50 days, declaring the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, saying, it was the will of God. You killed him, but it was God's will that he would raise him from the dead because it was impossible for the death to keep its hold on him. Now they remembered what Jesus had said, that I have come to conquer the death and the grave. Death cannot keep hold of Jesus, and it was his will. Then listen Paul's word. He said, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This was the gospel message preached. The wages of sin is death. Therefore, Jesus had to die. It was the foreknowledge of God, the will of God that he should die. But then death cannot get hold of him. He has to overcome death. He overcame death. He, re he was raised from the dead. They remembered that death has no power over Jesus. The difference was the remembrance or the belief in the words of Jesus Christ. Prior to going to the tomb, they did not remember, neither did they believe his word. After the angels visited them, they remembered what Jesus said and they believed. And the women come and tell the disciples, Peter and John again go and run. And they didn't find and finally Jesus appears to them and they were convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. The great reversal has taken place. Now they began to believe. Now they began to hope in him. And therefore, they were able to sacrifice their life. They were able to give up everything. Imagine, after 50 days of resurrection, there were thousands of people coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And God worked a miraculous work, and 3,000, 5,000, 7,000 people began to believe. But there was no place for them to stay in the city for a long time. They came with a limited amount of money from 15, 17 nations of the world. What happened? The disciples in Jerusalem began to sell their houses and property so that they could bring the money and fulfill the immediate need to feed these believers from many different nations. They were willing to sell their property, their houses, and eventually they were 
willing to die because they remembered the words of Jesus Christ that he rose from the dead and because he rose because he lives they also will live look at what Paul says in Colossians 2 13 to 15 they remember what happened here it says when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh God made you alive with Christ he forgave us all our sins having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us he has taken it away nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authority he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross Colossians 2 13 to 14 they, they, here Paul says Jesus took away everything that was against us and nailed it to the cross cancelled it forever and then not only did he do on the third day he rose again he made a spectacle he triumphed over them he was the victor coming into the city celebrating the victory and we were the trophies he rescued us from the hand of the devil. He rescued us from the wages of sin and death. He rescued us from hell and destruction. And now he comes to the Father and said, These are the trophies. These are the ones I have brought from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. This is my triumphant victory. And the enemy has been defeated forever. So they remembered the meaning and the value of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus died upon that cross and never rose from the dead, then he would not be different than any other religious leaders. But it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that sets him apart from any other who, who claims to be a religious savior. Then they remembered, once you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you died with him, and then you will rise up again. Not only did Jesus rise, we also will rise with him. Just let me read two verses in Romans chapter 8, where it says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You are free from the law of sin and death. The natural law of death has been cancelled. The scientific research cannot cancel the natural law as of yet. But in Jesus Christ, the Bible says, the law of sin and death has been cancelled. There's no condemnation. And in the same chapter, verse 16, uh, 13 to 16, you say, even our body, this mortal body, the body that will be decaying one day with the same resurrecting power of Jesus will rise up again. He will rise us up. Our bodies will be transformed by the power of God. Therefore, this great reversal has taken place in Jesus Christ. And when we go through tragedy like this, uh, the ferry sinking, the families are wailing and sorrowful. Even in that midst of sorrow like that, we still can look beyond the grave and say, one day I will meet my son, one day I will meet my daughter, one day I will meet my husband, one day I will meet my wife, my father, my mother. Because in Jesus Christ, a great reversal has taken place. Death is not enemy anymore. Death has no power anymore. It has been ridden and in the time we shall be together in eternity. Amen? Amen? So what makes the difference in this life? To live victoriously or defeated life is whether or not we trust the words of Jesus Christ. The disciples would have a different feeling if they had trusted the words of Jesus Christ and said, no, let us wait. In the upper room. Let us wait for the Lord to come. In fact, he has said, go to Galilee, I'll meet you there. Instead of going to Galilee, they are waiting in Jerusalem, and they are going to the grave looking for the dead body of Jesus Christ. Because they did not remember and did not believe the words of Jesus Christ. That applies 
In the same way today, my brothers and sisters, in your daily life, the moment you neglect the word of God, the moment you neglect trusting the promises of God, you are going to be disappointed in life. You are going to go through worry and fear and frustration in life. But you hang upon the words of Jesus Christ. Even though it is so dark, even though it is so hopeless, you hang upon the words of Jesus Christ that in John chapter 14 verse 19 he says, Because I live, you also shall live. The families that are holding on in the seesaw, if they could remember the words of Jesus Christ, even in their sorrow, in one hand they will be wailing and weeping, on the other hand they will be holding on the promise and say, yes, maybe I have lost my child here, but I still have a hope. My child still lives, because Jesus lives. In our personal life, maybe your dream is dead in one hand, but you still have your dream on the other hand. Jesus is my guarantor. His word is still alive. He said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and it shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Whatever you are asking, maybe your prayer is not been answered for a long, long period of time. It's dead as though. But on the other hand, you keep on trusting the words of Jesus Christ and you will be surprised. It may take many years, but the answer will come in God's time. Therefore, this, the great reversal has taken place. Death, physical death, is not our final. Your dreams, your hopes, your aspirations, your desires and wishes may appear dead at one hand, but if you keep on holding the promises of God, He has the power to bring them back to life. The only difference is, do you trust your feelings your circumstances, or do you trust the promises of God? And you may think, you may say, hey, Pastor, you don't know my situation, how terrible it is. Yes, indeed, I have gone through many, many difficult situations. And I, as I told you, one incident where I say I'm giving up, but the grace of God comes, and it it tells you there is still a God who cares for me. And therefore you remember His promises more. One time He rescues you, then you, you begin to trust Him more. Another time He rescues you, you begin to trust Him more, you trust Him more, you trust Him more. And there comes a time when you truly, truly believe the promises of God. And they do come true in your life. Shall we close our eyes for a moment and imagine this great reversal taking place in our own life. There is a future hope for our physical bodies because of the words of Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead and therefore he has the ability to give us life. Even while we live in this world, whatever is dead, Jesus has the power to resurrect it. The only thing we ought to remember is his promises and stand upon them and to remember them and His Word has creative ability to bring life back into your situation. Let's all stand together and sing with the worship team.